Um, I've always done a, a class on anti-Semitism. And I've done this because the hatred of Jewish people is, the, is what b many scholars consider to be the longest hatred in human history. And it's gone on for 2,000 years and a, just a really distinct 2,000 years of hate against a singular group of people. And we just really don't see that sort of thing. And not by the kinds of things that have happened, although to be sure, um, by measuring in that way, um, by what has happened to Jewish people, it is also um, quite pronounced. But just really the longest hatred. And you know, in my life, I can say that as someone who studies these issues and, and lives them and engages a lot in different places in the world and talks about things and meets lots of people, I can say that my own experience is that the history of, is that the dislike or hatred or prejudice against Jews is stronger than any other group that I've encountered just in, a, in, a, in across the, diaspora, the human diaspora. And, you know, I've been in, I tell the story sometimes of, I remember one time, I was in the Amazon rainforest and I took a boat up the, the Rio Napo and I went pretty far up actually and I came upon this community of this indigenous community. Shuar, it's a Shuar community, Shuar, it's an, uh, a tribe in, in the rainforest and it was talking to them and my name being Samuel or Samuel, Samuel in Spanish, it's Shmuel in Hebrew but uh, it's identified as a Jewish name, and so many people w over the years in Christian countries have asked me, or Christian places ask me if I'm Jewish, and, um, and I'm not, but again, I, w I was named after my, mo my mother's gynecologist. She didn't have a name when I was born, so I, I was the fifth child. She was 45 years old. It's just a point where it's just sort of, you get, she, I guess she was just tired of thinking about those things. Just, she said, whatever, I'll just name them after you. So... Uh, but one time I'm in this uh, with this group of people and they asked me if, if I was Jewish and I said, no, 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 soy cristiano. And they said, oh, or I'm not Jewish. I didn't say I was Christian. And they said, ah, gracias a Dios. Thank God. And I thought, wait, hang on a minute. Thank God that I'm not Jewish. I mean, like, even here, even in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, there's still a dislike of Jews. And I just thought, my God, I really kind of see it everywhere. So I've always done that class. And, but this, this time, this semester, I've switched it up a little bit. So we're going to talk about anti-Semitism, but then the context of something else that I really want to hit. In the, in the process, I want to say a few things about these three words. Number one, the vast majority of human beings act in just really thoughtful and, and uh, civil ways toward other human beings the vast majority of the time. 99.999% people are very civil toward one another. It doesn't matter who, who they're interacting with, even if they're interacting with their enemies, most people are civil most of the time. That, that's just, that's a thing, right? So if you have this idea that, you know, people are negative and people are bad and people are this and people are, they're, they're really, just, come on, they're not, we're not. Think of how much really hateful behavior you've witnessed just today of all the, thousands upon thousands of interactions you've witnessed all day long. People are primarily and essentially good. Um, peace is the norm. War is actually not the norm. Peace is the norm. Just because you read about war on the front pages of the newspaper um, doesn't mean that it's the common, um, it's a common reality around the world. The things that make it to the newspaper make it there because they're rare. And so war is rare. Peace is actually the norm throughout most of the world. And, you know, when you travel a lot and when you travel even in conflict areas, um, and, I, and I, as, as I do, and you sort of engage in lots of these ways, you, you, it just really drills itself home that um, peace is the norm. Um, the, the, the third thing is anybody can be violent. Anybody can be violent at any one point in time. Um, it doesn't matter what our culture is, what our socialization is, what our background is. Most any, I would say most anybody. There are some people it's just not possible to get them to that place. But for the most part, most anybody can be violent and certainly can be taught to be violent um, under the right circumstances. And, you know, militaries know this, right? We don't, you don't, we, there isn't like special people that join militaries. You have to really work hard to train people to kill. It goes against our, our inner nature to kill another human being and to hurt another human being. And so militaries 
over the years have had to do a lot of work to train people and get people to that place where they will take the life of another human being or do some sort of really terrible thing. And so, and, and we know that, and so, and of course, we also know that people bring that home with them. And, um, and if, you don't, if, you, if you're not paying attention to that, well, we'll get to that a little later. Um, soldiers bring that home. I mean, it really, it goes against our, the inner nature of, of who we are. Um, but, you know, sometimes violence is so, it, it erupts out of nowhere, and it is so widespread that lots of average, ordinary people engage in it. The hate that turns to violence, that turns to something really horrific like genocide, and that average, ordinary people engage in it. And this is the thing that really gets my sociological mind going. And it gets me going because if that's the case, if this is the case, then I have to say, well, that's me. I'm an average, ordinary human being. And so if, what could happen that could lead me to participate in some horrific event or horrific activity or, you know, forbidding all else, even a genocide, could lead me to engage in this thing that I never would want to imagine that I could do, right? This is, this is All right, so... If you're paying attention, I'm just going to point just a couple out, right? So if you're paying attention to the news, um, you know, you've, you've heard uh, Myanmar, you've kind of heard of this. If, if you haven't, you know, Burma and, and what, you know, these are refugees who are on their way to, who are been, they're Muslims and being kicked out of Myanmar, which is the, what we used to call Burma, and on their way to Bangladesh. And imagine that, you know, your life, you're, you're in such... So Buddhists, right? Buddhism is the one religion that we think of. If you think about a peaceful religion, think about Buddhism. There isn't another one that, where, where peace is, is such a core part of, you know, of, of the, the reality, right? I mean, Buddhists are the ones, you know, sitting around meditating you know, like this. I mean, it's just like you're meditating into a peaceful state with God and committing these horrible acts. Bro, next slide. So, um, the UN report on the genocide, of course, the, the Myanmar government says, well, it, you know, this is fake news. The, you know, the, the communities that have been burned to the ground. I mean, just all this horrific stuff, right? Okay. Um, so, here's Yemen. Yemen is still happening. Those of you, maybe you've heard of Yemen. So it's not Buddhists now, but these are Muslims. And these are Muslims who are killing other Muslims. And so we say, wow, Yemen, right? 10 million people on the brink of, of starvation. It is, next slide, according to the U.S., uh, the famine in Yemen could become the worst famine in living memory. Nothing to touch it. And we're talking about, you know, the Great War of Africa. We're talking about World War II. We're talking about just really thinking the famine. So this is what, I, I'm not going to, by the way, there, there, I, I guess I need to do, uh, I, people call it a trigger warning. I don't, I don't like that word. But you're going to see some things today that uh, some images and so on that are going to be uh, unsettling to many of you. So I guess I need to say that. Um, so, you know, here it is. So, so first we have Buddhists committing these crimes against Muslims. Now we have Muslims committing crimes against other Muslims and against Christians, of course, right? Okay. And then um, when we keep it in the context of that, if you're sitting here in the United States where things seem relatively peaceful and the wars are happening elsewhere and we're sending our militaries around the world to try to fix these things and, you know, it's always like those people. And, you know, they are like X or they are like Y or over there. Wherever over there is that very few of us have ever traveled. So we don't know who those people are over there. We don't know what they're like or how they are or anything like that. It just becomes this place. And then we look around us and it's like, well, we don't. And we're not. 
And over here, we're different. It's all, you know, it's there and it's here. It's the other and it's us. And the other being the person that we don't really understand. And so when I look at those images, or if I showed you images of atrocities committed by, in those just two of many, many conflicts that are happening right now. But again, relative to the population of the world, a very small number. But if I show you the images, you know, the first thought that you have is like those people. Are, there's something about them. What is it that allows them to do what they're doing? What is it allowed that makes us different? Why don't we have that here? Why isn't it going on here? So there must be something about us that's really different. But what I know as a sociologist is that like, well, actually, when I go back to my first statement, that anybody can really commit any of these crimes. So people with our ideology, people with our thought system, people with our religion, our, 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 right? And by our, I'm speaking to the majority of people in the United States who are Christians. Because that's the majority religion here. And so Christians, for example, have this idea, well, we don't do that. and We're not about that, right? Okay. So we think of Christians, these are the images he think most Christians will have here in the United States. People praying, children praying, people singing, people praising God, people praising Jesus. You know, if you don't have any images, if you haven't traveled around the world and you've been in some of these other places, you don't necessarily have the images of people doing the same thing in their religions. And how it very much looks the same. You know, different clothing and so on. But nonetheless, right? These are the images that people have. So I think about Christianity. And I look around me and I think of most Christians who I know and most Christians who I'm connected with. And I think, well, most Christians I know are really nice. Most Christians I know would never commit any crimes like that. And most Christians I know and most Christians I connect with are the kinds of people who are like this right here. They, they have children like that in the bottom right. They sing in choirs on the top right. And on the left, they listen to people like that who are speaking words that mostly are kind words. And you can be a, a snarky and you can pick out, you know, the more hateful Christians and the ones that are really kind of attacking and wanting to, attacking this group and that group and so on. But really, let's be clear, most Christians are, are not espousing this sort of thing. So you can hold your anti-Christian ideology, but if we go across the United States, the vast majority of thinking of the vast majority of Christians, the vast majority of the time, is kind and thoughtful and loving because that's just how human beings are. So... Now I go back, say, okay, well, what have Christians done? And I think, ah, let me think back to Rwanda. So I remember I was teaching an inequalities class, and I taught, I was teaching while this was happening. So this was one of the, the most, a pivotal moment in modern history. One of the, one of the, the you know, the Rwanda, the Hutus and Tutsis, right? And so, you know, you think about the Hutus really, um, targeting the Tutsis. This is 1994. In 100 days, 800,000 people died, and the vast majority of them died from machetes. Meaning knives. Just hack, being hacked to death. Not with guns, being hacked to death. And what is it that led Hutus to rise up and target Tutsis? And we're not talking militia, well, armies and militias. We're talking average ordinary people who came together and formed these militias and in a hundred days killed almost a million people. And that's not all the people that were wounded and harmed. And the vast majority of them are Christians. And think, well, okay, hang on. Well, but they must not be Christians in the way that I'm a Christian. Well, those Buddhists must not be Buddhists in the way that Buddhists are who I know. Or the Muslims not, might not, must not be Muslims in the way that I imagine them to be, but when I think about Christians killing other Christians or Christians killing other people, it's really easy for me to say, well, but they're not really Christians because Christians wouldn't really do that. And then I say, well, why is it difficult to look at Muslims who are killing other Muslims and say, well, but they're not really Muslims. So don't say Muslims are killing other Muslims. Say people who were raised Muslim or maybe somehow ascribe to some Islamic thinking or who knows what, or call themselves Muslim, but they're not really Muslims. And they are these people who are attacking other people 
who are, let's say, Muslims, or Buddhists who are not really Buddhists, but somehow they, they're in this Buddhist society, and maybe they think it, and maybe they were raised that way, etc., but they're killing somebody else. But it's easier to do that here with us, with Christians, because we live in a society where we don't see Christians doing that. So, all right, Mom. So what I want to do is talk about probably the greatest crime in human history committed by Christians. Now, when we talk about it, we talk about it as committed by Nazis, committed by Germans. The Germans did this, and the Nazis did this. But the population of Germany at the time, at the, in, the, in the 1930s, was about a little over 60 million people. And nearly all of them were Christians. A third were Catholics. Two-thirds were Protestants. And nearly all of them were Christians. In the same way that people here are Christians. They went to church. They worshiped Jesus. They worship God in the, from the Catholics, the, you know, the God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Mary, the whole thing. They read their Bibles. They sang hymns. They did everything Christians would do. But then something happened. Something happened. And they turned in this direction. The very large numbers of them committed one of the most horrific crimes in all of human history. A genocide that we now come to call the Holocaust. And about 11 million people died. About 6 million of them Jews. And not just in Germany, because there weren't very many Jewish people living in Germany at the time. So all the surrounding areas, right? But something happened that these good, God-fearing Christians that are no different than the vast majority of Christians that any of us know in here, something happened to capture their thinking that allowed them to do something so horrific as to commit this genocide, this holocaust. And you know, what that means, if that something could happen there, it could happen here. If something could happen, like that could happen to average, ordinary, good, family-loving, community-loving Christians there, then it could happen here. And if Christians did that, then they're no different than the Buddhists in Myanmar killing the Muslims. And they're no different than the Muslims killing the Muslims. And they're no different than Hindus attacking the Muslims and Muslims attacking the Hindus and but so on and so forth. Because it means it's in all of us. So I can no longer hide behind this idea that, well, we don't do that. Christians don't, good people don't, people in the West don't do that. They, those people over there, that's what happens. But here, us, our people, it's different. So I'm going to show you a video from Dachau. Now, what I, I didn't used to, I stopped for a long time, I stopped showing stuff and talking about the, the, uh, the Holocaust because it just seemed like so many people had seen videos and so you kind of knew what happened and people saw the images and so on. But then I got to the point really maybe quite a number of years ago, I realized a lot of y'all in your generation have never really seen the images. So I'm going to show you this video. We're not going to play the sound. You can watch it on your own to hear the sound. It's just a narrator. It doesn't, the narrator doesn't talk very much. But I'm going to walk us through the video as we watch it. And by the way, these, this is a Jewish couple. And so the way we, they identify, the, the Nazis identify, not just in German, but in the other countries where they had taken control, they identify who the Jews were. They had to have stars. 
So you, somehow you got to identify them, right? Like we might identify who the undocumented immigrants are. We might identify who this group is or that group is. But, you know, that's one way they did that. And so you first have to, you know, get everybody and so then you can kind of round them up when it's time. But they said that your proposition is wrong, that the whole time Europe was Christian, yet they were against the Holocaust. They're, they aren't able to separate okay, the Nazi right, here, regime. Yeah, all right. Let me respond to that. Look, there's nothing in Christianity that makes Christians more violent than anybody else. Just like there's nothing in Islam that makes Muslims more violent than anybody else. There's nothing in any ideology that makes people more violent. There's nothing in Judaism that makes Jews more or less violent than anybody else. There's nothing at all. My point here is that anybody, anybody can engage in violence the likes of which we're going to, I'm going to show you right now. It doesn't matter. So if, for those of us who are Christian, as an example, we can't hide behind this idea that, well, we don't do that because our love of Jesus would keep us from doing that. You can't hide behind that. You can stand behind it. Not all Christians engage in violent behavior. And other Christian nations in Europe were fighting against the Nazis. That's not the point. The point is that anybody just in the Middle East there are Muslim nations and Muslim groups and Muslims all over the Middle East who are trying to stop the violence and stop the war and the killing. So all in this time are Christians who are standing up to say, look, we have to stop this. And yet, who's doing the killing but people who were essentially Christian? They went to church on Sundays. They did the things that Christians did. There's nothing unique. There's nothing special. So here. So listen, this is Dachau. What the Nazis did once the final solution came, first off, they rounded up Jews all over. Not in, not, again, there weren't many Jews in Germany, but the idea was we're going to, as they took over Czechoslovakia, as they took over Poland, as they took over different places, the point was to go in and find Jews and round them up. And you got to put them in camps. And you had two thing, reasons. The first reason to put them in camps was so that they can work for you. Slave labor. So you have all these camps around. You have them in Germany. You have them in Poland. You have them in the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia at the time. You have them in lots of places. We had camps. The Germans built camps. And the first thing was we're going to get them to work for us. And they're going to do these things. And then... Once the final solution comes around, then the idea is, well, ultimately we're going to kill them because we're going to exterminate Jews. We're going to get rid of all Jews. And so these are all images of the camps of Dachau after this one, after it was liberated. And these are Jews who came from really all over Europe. Six million Jews were killed. Not all of them were taken to camps and killed. In, in Poland, for example, most Jews were simply rounded up taken outside of communities and, and summarily shot. Mass graves, about a million Jews in Poland were killed. Look at, so they were brought by trains from all over Europe. And, you know, though most, you know, increasingly conditions were terrible. People died in the trains, crammed in the cars, crammed in the cattle cars. All done by Christians. Keep, keep this in mind. These are all Christians who are doing the killing. Now you can say, but they're not really Christians because real Christians wouldn't do that. That's fine. I agree with you. I absolutely 100% agree with you. Just like the Muslims who are doing killing, like in ISIS, you're not really Muslims. So here, these are all people pulled out of the cars because they didn't make the journey. And their bodies are going to get buried. And just, I just want you to watch the images. Millions upon millions upon millions of people. It's just immensely disturbing to think that human beings could do this to other human beings. These are, these are all prisoners. These are all Jewish prisoners here who are having to take the bodies and do something with them. Six million. And you know, I've been at a couple of concentration camps, right? Like I've seen this with my eye. I've seen, I've seen where it is. Many, some of you have. Those of you who are Jewish, many of you have. Look, who does this? Who does this? 
Who could do this to another human being? Anybody. Anybody. Because if these, these are townspeople, after they liberated the camps, they would bring townspeople in to say, hey, here's what was happening there. Look at, look at bodies. This is an entire population of people. And people who knew. happening all over look just look 11 million 6 million so here's you know they had so they built these gas chambers because you know like it's really difficult to get rid of bodies you so they decided well we're going to burn them and so they would you know people would hang their clothes on the outside these are the prisoners who once they decided okay we're just going to start killing all the jews because we have no need for them anymore and we want to exterminate them we want to get them into dust and so Here's like the, the bath. And then, you know, on the, on the ceilings, you know, they would put, the, the gas would come down. So the prisoners would think that they were going in to get some kind of a bath, a shower, right? And then the Zyklon B, the, ga, the gas would come down and they would all be taken out. And then they would be put in what would be ovens. And, you know, when you see these, when you, you know, you see it, like, you know, when I was at Auschwitz and I just see the ovens lined up one after another after another, you just keep putting bodies in. Because, it, again, it's really hard to get rid of that many human bodies. It's, it's really difficult. And so you got to come up with these, just these ways, and the Nazis came up with ways. But who were the Nazis? Well, the Nazis were Germans. Who were Germans? They were Westerners. They were advanced Westerners. They were advanced in their thinking. Germany was one of the hubs of philosophy of the world. These are all, this is what they found when they opened the bodies after, or the ovens after they liberated the camps. Who does this? Well, in this case, Christians did it. In this case, it was Christians. I'm not attacking Christians. I'm just pointing out the obvious. Look. This is what the liberators found. Some of you, maybe your, your grand, mostly grandfathers, although maybe your grandmothers, who were part of the liberation. The longest hatred, the longest hatred of Jews. You know, like, you don't, it has to be a deep, a deep, a powerful hatred to do that to other human beings. It has to be really, really deep. And you know, the scary thing is, it's honestly, when, when, I, when I look at everyone in here, and then I think of myself, and I want to think that I couldn't participate in that. That I would have been one of the people who spoke up. I would have been one of the people that said no. I would have been one of the people who put my life on the line to the Nazis, to the other Christians around me, who yesterday are going to church with me and today are out doing what? Rounding up Jews? To kill them? I would like to think that I would be the one who would say no. That's not going to happen. But the truth is, I'm just going to sit with the rest of you right? It's just like I'm sitting here just like a faceless person in the crowd. Just like, no, why do you think I'm special? I'm not going to be special. I'm no more special than any of you. And there are a few of us in here who would stand up to it, but most of us wouldn't. You, you, you can't hide behind your, I don't care what Muhammad says. I don't care what the Quran says. I don't care what the Buddha says. What Vishnu, what Siddharth says. It doesn't matter what your gods say. It's irrelevant. In the moment, any of us can be one of those people who just throws caution to the wind, takes on the cloak of hate, and becomes that person who can do that to other human beings, including Christians. Doesn't matter how much you love Jesus, my friends. Doesn't matter. In the moment, you can become one of them. And you know, that's like frightening to me. Because I like to think that I'm a really good human being. 
I, I grew up in a Christian household. I grew up with Christian ideology. I understand the teachings of Christ. And I focus on the love. I don't focus on the hate. I focus on the, the, the negative stuff. I focus all on the love. And I think, okay, but I'm going to hold on to that. It's like, well, that's what I would expect him from Germans. Go. So here's one of the a rally at Nuremberg. This is about a million people, a Nazi rally. And they're all Christians. They're all Christians. In church on Sunday, rallying and saluting Hitler in the SS on this day. Wow. What changes? What changes? And had Germany been a Muslim? It's different. You see, like, what happens? What happened to them? Just like I asked myself, you know, when I, a couple, couple months ago when I was in Iraq, and I'm talking to Iraqis, and I'm sitting there engaging with people who are just so amazing and beautiful and, like, awesome human beings and big hearts. And, like, and I'm thinking... But you could turn to the dark side. Right? And I talked to Jews about Palestinians in Gaza who turn to the dark side. And I talked to Christians who turn to the dark side. I think, man. Next one. So, you know, here's just a couple things just to show you. Here's Hitler with a couple of German cardinals, Right? Um, here we are, some other German, these are Catholics doing the, the Sig Heil, right? Kind of making sure he doesn't quite get it right. And here's a Protestant, these are deacons, and this is a Protestant gathering in 1933. Look at, there's the swastika. These are all Protestant deacons. These are leaders in the Protestant churches. And coming down, and this is all after the final solution. This is before, this is after. So we're going to give our allegiance to this guy after the killing has already started. It's like, wow. So, last, um, I've always feel a certain obligation to talk about anti-Semitism because the hatred of Jews is, it, 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 it's still pretty strong. I don't know, I, I know, I have an idea of where it comes from. I'll say something about that later. About where, how it emerged out of Christianity. Um, of Jews identified as killing Christ, meaning committing deicide. Meaning, you, you know, you kill God because Christ is God. And so, you know, Jews identified as being the killers of God and killers of Christ. And so that just was a hatred that wove itself into um, Christian teachings for 2,000 years, which is, of course, the foundation for hatred of Jewish people on the part of Christians. Um, but anyway, I do this talk, and last um, semester I did the talk, and I was contacted by somebody in Germany. And she said, hey, um, you know, really... Uh, I watched your lecture on anti-Semitism and, you know, kind of went out around and lots of different people were watching it and so on. And she said, you know, I have a few things to add to it. And so she, you know, uh, said a lot of really fascinating things. And it turns out that, you know, her family had um, lived in Germany, her grandparents, and went through the Holocaust. And she, not, she's not Jewish, um, but lived through it. And... Um, so she had a lot to say because I wanted to know, the question I always want to know is how do ordinary, average, everyday human beings turn to the dark side and do something that's so horrible? Because all that stuff in that video was committed by average people. They're not monsters. They're no, they're no different than any of us in here. They're not monsters. They're average people. We can call them after the fact. We can call them monsters. But then after the fact, they just went back to their lives. The people who were committing these horrible crimes. Well, in fact, they were the milk, the milkman, and the mailman, and the 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 the, the you know the woman who's the architect or the school teacher or the this or the that or the engineer. It doesn't matter. They all go back to their lives after this period of being monsters. So anyway, 
So she said, well, actually, I have a lot to say about that because I've heard stories from my family over the years about who people were and what they were. And so I said, hey, next time I do this class, I want you to come and visit the class via Skype and just say some things to my class about it. So anyway, uh, Anika, um, Anika, actually, is here. Hey, Anika, how are you? Hey, Sam, how are you? Um, Not bad. So I should say, by the way, that, that we just officially met yesterday via Skype when we did a test call. Um, but I, I really appreciate you reaching out to me. And um, yeah, thanks for coming to the class. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And you can hear me well, I assume. Yes. All good. Hey, um, so tell me why, if you can take yourself back a couple months, why did you initially contact me? I mean, I know you, maybe you just heard me say something, but what is it that led you to initially contact me? Um, I think it was the, um, the statement that at some point you said that Hitler stated that he had formed his movement uh, as a Christian movement. I was like, oh, that, that kind of goes against all the stuff that I've heard and I've learned. Um, because the Nazis were not particularly religious as such. Yeah. But they used a lot of religious experiences. They, they created religious-like rituals um, and used that kind of feeling um, rather than actual religion. So it's not... Uh, it's so not a connection to God per se, but rather and, and I, wanting to make people feel larger than life and feel yeah. something that's really outside of themselves, like at the rallies and so on. Or, or, per, or perhaps maybe very, very small and as a part of a huge thing, but themselves very small. You have to look at the architecture. It's mm, yeah. gr hey. gigantic. Yes. You know, you yes. feel really small looking at Nazi architecture standing in front of it. It makes you feel tiny. So, yeah, it, it was all this um, kind of um, dissolving into the big German race people. So, okay, so here's an, and let me, let's go right into this question that I think is most interesting for me and the one that I'm really trying to get my students to, to under, what, what, I, what I want to do is not have anyone sort of push this outside of themselves, right? And so how much did average ordinary Germans know about what was happening? What have you been told by your family? Like, what do you know? What do you? Um, I've been told basically that you knew as much as you wanted to know. Um, the information was there. If you went through life with open eyes, it was there to see. But then at the same time, two people look at the same picture and they don't come away with the same information. They don't take away the same. In, you know, you, you might say, you might show the same picture to two people and one will come back with, oh, um, yeah, big story and all the details. The other one will say like, oh, yeah, there was a tree maybe. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what do you do with the information? that you get, do you, does it register? Do you think about it? Um, and then what do you do with the information? Maybe it's dangerous to know. Maybe it's, it's dangerous to, to verbalize thinking about these things. So it's maybe better not to know anything. And you just kind of push that away. But um, I mean, especially in the big cities, after the airstrikes, um, concentration camp inmates were used to clear rubble. That was pretty obvious, and people walked past them. Uh, there were in Berlin alone. There were about four thousand um, small forced labor camps because you had to keep the economy running. Right? Everybody was at war, and that was pretty obvious. You know, you walked past them. You saw the barracks. You saw all these sheds where. Um, the people from Eastern Europe were held in slave-like conditions. Um, you could, of course, look at that, or you could just cross the street and look the other way. So, um, 
That's actually really disturbing to me because as a teacher, one of the reasons that I teach is because I want to get people to look at things in new ways. And I don't want to tell them the truth because I don't think I have the truth. But I want them to get to look, to walk down the road and look at something that maybe they've never looked at in the past and actually have to interpret it. So when you say people knew as much as they wanted to know, and I think about how many Americans and how many people in my class, for example, are not looking at Yemen and the U.S. role in Yemen and the U.S. role in various things around the world, but are really going to just be busy doing something else because they just, it just feels better. Or maybe just being interested. Also, I mean, you had this, what do you call it, government shutdown, lockdown, shutdown. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. over, right? <laughs> it kept on going for a long time. But I'm relatively sure that you will find people in America who didn't notice, who didn't read the newspaper, didn't watch news on TV, didn't have any reason to interact with the government. And Oh, there was a, really, that happened? You will find people like that, yes. probably. So, so then if we go to, so now let's go back to Germany. Um, mm -hmm. In the 30s and the 40s. So you had a lot of people who just really survived by keeping their heads down and not asking questions. And mm. okay. they, didn't well, do any, they didn't do anything really horrible. They mm. just didn't do anything positive to help resolve the situation or make things better. Yeah. Well, the Nazis did something really, really effective very early on. Because, you know, when, when the Nazis came to power, nowadays we tend to think of, oh, yeah, landslide vote, they were in power, that was it. But it wasn't really that clear cut. So they knew they had to really nip any kind of resistance in the bud right away. And beginning of 1933, the communists were starting to make noises about strike action and organizing people. And they just started arresting people left, right, and center, thousands and thousands of them. And they would bring them to places to just basically really hurt them. They, the message was, if you criticize us, we will hurt you, we will cripple you, we will break you, we will make you afraid of your own shadow, and maybe for the heck of it, we'll just kill you in the end. And many of them did not survive these initial arrests, they were in fact either actively killed or just died of the, um, the, the after effect of torture. And so, and this was like your grandfather, right? I'm gonna show a couple of photos. Yeah. Um, if you go to, go to the next slide. So this is, so these are, so my class, the two people in the front are Annika's great grandparents and that's her grandfather there and her grandmother um, yeah. in a small gathering. And the next slide, that is, this is her grandfather here holding a plant, right? Look at the Nazi symbol in the back. But they were, they were communists, right? So these, these, they were not Nazis at all. They were anti-Nazis, which is why your grandfather was, um, was arrested and imprisoned, right? For five years, right? Uh, no, no, it was, um, he, I mean, he was really young. He was just 18. So for him, the imprisonment was actually really short. My, his parents were in prison a little bit longer, but the, the place where they were brought was not designed to be long-term imprisonment. It was more like really instilling fear and sending a message, sending the message to um, people who might criticize or might speak out to really, we will hurt you if you oppose us, and also sending a message to people who might not oppose the Nazis, that it's really okay to hurt, um, rob, abuse people who don't toe the line. Mm -hmm. And so if we go to this other photo, so this was a, a wedding. This is your grandfather here playing the banjo. And, but, you know, some of these folks were not in your family, so they weren't avowed communists per se. Because, but, mind you, the Nazis murdered many communists. So... Um, many, some of them could be Nazis or Nazi sympathizers or just not, they're just average people. So like, you know, just turn their backs. Just don't look, don't pay attention, don't engage. 
Um, and, you know, I think about the war here. I think about the most recent war, the Iraq War, and I think about the pressures that people felt to be patriotic and to be pro-American. If you even dared to question the war, and especially after it started, and you didn't support the troops, and you didn't support the U.S. and our larger mission, just how, just the, the power of the, the, the judgment and the hate that, you know, we, people experienced from other people. I mean, the shame of not being pro-American and supporting the troops and supporting the war. So just that is here, and I imagine how much more powerful it would have been in, um, in Nazi Germany at the time. Yeah. And it wasn't just, like, getting all the, the people who might have um, started sort of uprising but it was also showing Germans that, look, if you do anything, we take away your dreams and your livelihoods. Like my grandfather, he wanted to be an architect. He was a few months away from sitting his exams that then would have enabled him to apply to university. Mm -hmm. And he was not allowed to sit exams after that mm -hmm. because of his family, because of the political situation. So... There you go. All the all the work, all the dreams, gone. Yeah, yeah. No. It's it's no. very. Yeah, it's very it's very profound. It's very disturbing, actually. And I think you know from what a couple of the things that you wrote. Once again, I want to go back to this, this mm -hmm. idea that we people knew what they wanted to know, and um, and same in the United States, right? We knew uh, people knew about the camps. I mean, the camps. It's now. Mm -hmm. People are starting to write more and more about how quickly U.S. intelligence knew about what was happening um, mm -hmm. and uh, the building of the camps, what happened in the camps, and the killing of, of not just Jews but trade unionists and communists and Catholics and other people, right, and um, the Roma people. And so even here, we just need to turn a blind eye. And I think about how many Americans turn a blind eye to all of the things that our government is involved in right now and just don't want to look at it. And I think, well, it's the same thing that happens over and over again. Yeah. That, that facility where my great-grandparents and my grandfather was, were imprisoned um, was actually pretty much in the city center. Well, not city center, but in the city. It was not some out-of-the-way place. It was the, um, in the basements of uh, army, former army barracks. There were businesses there. There were people living there. And I, several of the inmates stated later on that in front of the windows um, where they were held, there, their cells, there were not really small cells. There were like really rather big rooms where maybe 20, 25, 30 people were imprisoned at the same time with you know, some some straw on the ground to sleep on, and that was it. Um, there was a, well, the equivalent of a hot dog cart person. <laughs> and the facility that they were running there had to actually relocate from the city center location relatively quickly because residents and business owners were complaining. But they were not complaining, hey, I hear screams. What is going on? They were saying, shut these people up. They're, they're actually chasing away my customers. Mm -hmm. So people who were walking past the sellers were hearing people scream in pain, in horrible pain. And their first reaction was not, oh, I got to help somehow. It was, oh, this is bad for business. Yeah, that's, that's really... Well, just sit with that for a second. Hey, um, um, so I want to, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk briefly about the rise of the neo-fascist movement in Europe right now and including, I know that in Germany it's illegal to hold it, have a swastika, um, mm -hmm. but nonetheless the rise of neo-Nazis all around Europe um, and the and the the reemergence of the hatred, of course, of Muslims and foreigners, but also the reemergence of the the hatred of Jewish people. 
Can you, do you, are you seeing that? Like, what, what, do you, what do you make of that? Or what's the, what's the conversation that, that you're having with friends? Or I know well, I'm right putting now, you on the spot. Just about the rise of neo-Nazis. So yeah, because I'm, it's a little bit disturbing, to be honest. I mean, we have our own version of it here in the U.S. with white nationalists, right? But. Um, I think the most disturbing bit about it, or what people are most disturbed about at the moment in Germany is that we have this new pretty right-wing party, I would say extreme conservative, <laughs> lightly speaking. Some people say they have like connections to neo-Nazis, but for the very first time, these kind of people, they get a whole lot of votes. And it's not just the disenfranchised guy who didn't make 10th grade or, you know, has been unemployed for 20 years or something like that, who, you know, not the fringes of, uh, of, the, of society, but it's, it's people with families, with jobs, with cars, who go on holiday twice a year, you know, the middle of society, mm. right? The middle of society. And when so many votes are gained to the very, very extreme right, that feels scary. In some areas of Germany, they are actually, yeah, maybe second, second biggest party now. Mm-hmm. Or in some cases, they even the uh, the forecasts are like they could they could be the, the most successful party in those areas. Um, I would say they I wouldn't call, call them neo neo Nazis as such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Na- national, national parties. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I think I, w- I would just call it refer. I guess I would refer to them as nationalist parties because that's really yeah. kind of what it. Yeah. yeah. So that that's um, actually that's quite disturbing, actually. Given you know this video that I just showed, it's like, do you all do you have any sense of like of what happened in the past and what can happen again with a certain mindset, but. Oh, yeah, because you give people power over other people and they will use it. Yeah. If, you know, they, in Germany, certain groups of people were labeled fair game. And immediately, people who may not have felt very good about themselves or were angry or whatever, used that power over them. You can kick somebody, they kick. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that is a certain dynamic which can creep up anytime, anywhere. Yeah, I, I mean, I lived in the UK for several years, and a lot of friends of mine were saying after the Brexit vote, um, they felt suddenly felt uncomfortable as Europeans in the UK mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. people felt validated as, oh, you know, you're leaving the EU now. Um, I can tell the stupid French guy at the bus stop to go home where he came from, or I can be nasty to the mom of the Polish classmate of my child because I just I feel like it. I'm British. I'm better, and that 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 sort of thing. It's I'm not really comparing it to the Nazis because that would be trivializing the Nazis, but it's the same kind of psychological dynamic or well I think yeah I'm with you I I 100% agree with you and I think the thing that stands out and the reason I'm talking about this topic in the way that I am in class today is because we can all say well that it wouldn't happen here or it can happen here or it didn't happen here but what happens is it's a wave that sweeps really fast Mm. and the Nazi, that wave swept really quickly. And before you know it, people all around were doing these horrible things. And you say, how the heck, how did that happen in such a short period of time? And that's what's most disturbing. And I think that's what you're pointing out, even just like the Brexit vote. People hold that stuff down and we see it in the United States. People contain their anger and their rage and their judgment and then they just have that opportunity to release it, and it releases. And 
you know, we don't know what the future is. And that's just what's disturbing, I think. Um, and, and Nazi Germany, there was also, when they first, you know, they got rid of any kind of, you could say, first responders that might have done something. And then they immediately put a system into place that made sure that absolutely everybody is busy all the time and under control. Mm. You know, like 10 years old, you join the Hitler Youth. Um, most people left school after eighth grade. After eighth grade, there was a mandatory agricultural year, which not only came with home economics and paramilitary training, but also with lots of propaganda. And then it kept on going. You may, might, maybe you've done your apprenticeship and then you had to go into labor service, mm. which was on the military. And then you went into the military and it just it was never ending. You were always in some kind of program. It's just always something, you know. Hey, one, one final. Um, yeah, always something. I think that, that's one thing I've really gotten from speaking. Um, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you on the screen. I'm going to talk a little bit. And, and then if you have something you want to. Is that okay? Just know we're, it's, we're just watching you. So. <laughs> so anything you do, we see. But I'm gonna, I want to just talk a little bit and then see if you. Can you go to the next slide? So. One of the things we, I mentioned about uh, you know, Christianity, and you really have to understand the degree to which anti-Jewish ideology was built into Christian theology. So just those of you who are Catholics, this was the doctrinal teachings of the Catholic Church up until the Second Vatican Council. So all the Jews in Palestine were responsible for the execution of Jesus. All Jews currently living are responsible for the execution of Jesus. And God rejected Jews because they murdered Jesus. And it was only, this is part of the, the Good Friday, um, um, the Good Friday service, the per perfidious Jews, which means untrustworthy Jews. They only took that out at the Second Vatican Council. So you understand, it wouldn't take much if you're taught about Jews killing God and weaving this into the theology, Christian theology, and not just the Catholic Church, but the Lutheran Church. And if you know anything about Martin Luther, you know that his, his teach, you know, it's as if Adolf Hitler took all of his Nazi ideology and the final solution right directly out of Martin Luther's teachings. And if you're a Protestant, you owe your Protestantism to Martin Luther because he is the very first Protestant. He is the person that broke away from the Catholic Church. And so, you know, this is just really immensely disturbing. And so then I say, okay, so you get it, right? You, you get that. This is, it just, it, it didn't just come out of nowhere. This is part of the teachings of Christianity. The Jews did this horrible thing. So it wasn't just chance that, the, not, that in Germany, when it came time, when, when Jews were selected to be the group that would be extinguished, that it was them and it wasn't somebody else. This was 2,000 years of deep hatred. So I want to show you this other thing really fast. Um, besides the fact that Jewish people are 0.2% of the population in the world, and when we ask people, the number will be you know, the average number will be 10, 15 to 20 percent. This idea that Jews are taking over the world and so on. I just want to point that out. But here, um, so this guy, um, you say like, okay, well, but this isn't happening today. Well, it's not happening. It is happening today. Anti-Semitism is happening today. You're maybe just not paying attention so let me just bring something out to show you how deeply rooted it is in our society that if people responded to anti-Semitism the way we respond to things that happen to black people or many brown people, things would be very different. So this guy right here, so he's a fairly popular um, minister and I'm going to tell you whose minister he is in a second, but um, talked about two methods to convert people um, to Christianity. And, you know, there, this is a thing that people talk about, right? The fisherman approach, where, you know, you go and you, 
you, you, you, you fish, you go out and you proselytize and you're like a fisherman, you throw your hook, you know, your lure, your bait in the water and you just see who you can bring in and you then pro- you teach them about the love of Christ and all of the wonderful things. And so, you know, um, you use grace, right? So he talks about, he was doing a sermon about, well, there are two ways and one is the fisherman approach, but the other is the hunter approach. And to hunter when you fish and you fish and you fish, but that person refuses to take the bait, then sometimes you just got to go and hunt them down and you have to kill them. And that says that the, the, he turned his attention to the hunters and believes that you, know, you use violence to the same end. And he quotes, and the Lord says, and if they won't respond to grace, you're going to, I, the Lord, am going to raise up the hunters And then he says, and the most famous hunter of all was a hunter sent by God, and his name was Adolf Hitler. The Jews wouldn't convert, and so we will hunt them down and kill them. Okay? So he gives this sermon. Now, the thing is, he's a close pastoral friend to this guy, who's a senator, and was running for president. And when this came out, this guy's running for president. So this is one of the most powerful people in the United States. And this is what he said. Well, I'm grateful for his dedication and his call a generation of young people to prayer and spiritual commitment. And Heidi, that's his wife and I, are grateful to have his prayers and support. And with the support of Mike and many other people of faith, we'll fight the good fight, finish the course, and keep the faith. Faith. He didn't reject him. He didn't say, hey, listen, Mike, Pastor Bickle, you essentially are saying that God gave permission to hunt down and kill Jews. And nobody was up in arms. And I think, how deep is anti-Semitism in the United States that a fairly well-known, not like, you know, the Falwells or something, but fairly well-known guy could make statements like that and a senator running for president does not have to disavow him for saying such a thing. Essentially, Jews in this classroom will try the fisherman approach. But if you don't convert to Christianity, we're going to hunt you down. And God gives us good Christians permission to do that. Think about that. He's still a senator. He didn't even have to, he didn't even have to disavow the guy. He didn't even have to say he's no longer my friend. He's no longer my pastor. He's no longer consults with me about Christianity. He had to say nothing. That is how deep anti-Semitism is. Just because you don't see it, you don't see a lot of things. It's because you don't see it doesn't mean it's here. There are a lot of things you don't see. Doesn't mean they don't exist. So, do you do you have a thought? Do you have people? You don't have anyone in Germany saying stuff like that. I would. That's illegal. That would be illegal to say that in Germany. Am I right? That would be illegal. Yes. That that would be prosecuted post haste. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's kind of, it's disturbing, right? For me, I mean, I don't. I mean, to hear something like this openly, yeah, definitely. So it makes me wonder what people are saying, not openly. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And the and you know in the when they're not being recorded or they're not yeah it's really quite amazing. Hey, any, um, hey, thank you for coming. Any final words that you would like to leave us with? Um, maybe one thing. It was to... resisting the Nazis was mostly fatal. Um, but there were still people who did it. And I think that is absolutely amazing. 
there were in Berlin alone, there were about 7,000 Jews that were hidden by German families or German individuals. And about half of them survived. And the people who were hiding them, they, they risked their own lives, they risked their families' lives. Um, and that, I think, is absolutely amazing. You don't hear a lot about it. But, I mean, you could be arrested for being a hipster, basically, for having the wrong taste in music and clothes. And you can only imagine what the risk was for people to take somebody into their homes and hide them. Mm. So. Or, you know, all the other small groups that were working within Germany yeah. all through the Third Reich. Yeah. They were there. They were just doomed to failure, mostly. Because so, of this very effective system. So the, your message then is, if or when, or if, let's say if, let me emphasize if, because I'd rather think if, we, any of us are confronting such things that we, we can speak up and say no. Hey, uh, thank you. Thanks for visiting. Really, I appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. We, you can you can stay on if you I, I, I actually we have five more minutes you know why don't you go and then you can watch the stream um, it'll be easier hey I want to just can I just hear from a I don't I want I really feel like I want to hear from a couple of Christians um, are we are we like are we all right right bro it's just more of like a question so mm -hmm. I was just curious as to what it would be like for Jews who came back from the concentration camps yeah. to live with people who basically kind of disowned them. Well, so many people did not stay in Europe, just could not stay. Couldn't, first off, they lost everything, right? And it was almost, it was very difficult and things were destroyed. It wasn't just you lose your house. Maybe you just lose your property and the house is half standing or whatever. People lost their property. You're not going to get it back. You, do you want to go back to... The anti-Semitism, the hatred of Jews didn't go away. Like, it didn't like the end of the... Wait, hang on, listen to this. At the end of the war, it didn't go away. It's like, oh, we were wrong. We're still Christians. We still have the same beliefs. It's still there. So this is, of course, the emergence of the state of Israel as a homeland for Jewish people. And like, of course, why wouldn't you have the state of Israel for a homeland for Jewish people? And why wouldn't, if you were Jewish, you would want that, for sure, yeah. Is that cool? Some, any, somebody else? Anyone? Who yeah, else? there was a tweet. Um, pretty much it's just saying that you're ignoring the fact that it was a lot of to do with World War I, and I've seen this in the comment yeah. section on YouTube yeah, yeah, a lot. Yeah. You're ignoring the fact that World War I had an impact, economics had a lot of impact, but what people aren't remembering or aren't realizing is that those are like pillars to yeah. why Nazism happened, where the base of all of the understanding that Nazis believed, or at least you know, the ones who actually had power, they were the ones that were Christian. Most people in Germany were Christian. That's why we keep pushing Christianity and saying that Nazis were Christians. Not that Christians are Nazis. Yeah. For the love of God, we're not saying that. I am a born and baptized Christian. I'm not a Nazi. So we can't make those parallels, but you have to understand that the basis, the baseline is Christianity. Christi That's all we're saying. Meaning that Christianity doesn't protect us. And yes, you know, a lot of us stem from perception. They controlled all of those things. That was all part of it. That's all part of the hatred of, of Jews. Yes. Um, I was just going to say, like, we talk about it not happening in America, but there's actually a social experiment that was done called the Third Wave, which I don't know if you've ever heard of before. Yeah. But it happened in 1967, and it kind of explains actually how, like, the Nazi movement got its mo like movement, and they actually recreated something a lot like it in a yeah. high school. And it got so bad that it actually needed to be shut down by the police. And it's just like really interesting that kind of goes in line with a lot of what we're talking about. So. Yeah, yeah, there have been a lot of experiments to try to understand how it is that average ordinary people could do such things. You know, the Stanford experiments and all Sam, sorts of things. Sam, I have one over here. Yeah, okay, well, wait, can you just wait? We have, I have 60 seconds. Yes. 
Okay, well, I'm Christian, but it doesn't have anything to do with the fact yeah. that, um, like you were saying that if we feel like it's not present in America, every time you hear someone say, you're such a Jew, that's anti-Semitism. If you're yeah, making yeah. fun of someone's nose because yeah, yeah, they're yeah. Jewish, that's anti-Semitism. Like, they may come in forms of microaggressions, but it's still definitely a thing yeah. um, here in America that we see. Yeah, it's still, it's still around. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. All right, see you all. <laughs>